All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the International Soccer Podcast by Canada Soccer Files. I'm Kevin. And I'm Connor. And today we will be continuing our group by group preview of Euro 2020 by looking at Group D. That's right. We are going to uh, have three parts to this uh, podcast. So we'll begin by looking at an overview of the groups, looking at the uh, uh, rankings, odds, head-to-head, a comparison of the size uh, of each country, and a general overview. That's part one. Part two will be our team-by-team overview. Uh, As always, this is our our longest section where we look at Uh, each team's long history, their recent history, uh, their qualification record, and a brief overview of the players. That's right. We're still considering doing a deep dive on the the players, so here it'll be just a fairly superficial overview. Uh, And part three is a discussion of the prospects of the teams and our predictions. So, Connor, what are you wearing as a shirt today? Well, we're talking about two teams in the British Isles, um, so I thought I'd I'd put on a red Cardiff City jersey, which is my best approximation uh, for Wales. <laughs> okay, well, that's a disgraceful bias. I, on the other hand, am remaining neutral and wearing a Mexico shirt from uh, that I actually bought in Mexico. I try to buy these shirts in the country uh, that I get them from, but that doesn't always work, and uh, you will find me notably less biased than connor today let's go to part one all right Uh, yeah go ahead with the overview so group d is what we'll be talking about today uh that involves england croatia czech republic and scotland so after making the semi-finals of the 2018 world cup Uh, England entered the European Championships on the back of their best tournament result uh, since Euro 1996. Okay, well, Croatia went one better than England and got their best result since uh, World Cup 1998 uh, after reaching the final uh, of the most recent World Cup. Uh, They ended England's hope in the process of doing that. The Czech Republic uh, were not one of the teams to compete in Russia, but they are competing uh, in their seventh straight Euros tournament. Quite an impressive record. Yeah, it is. And uh, okay, well, <laughs> we'll get into the details that uh, of that. Scotland, the fourth team, are making their first appearance uh, in major tournament this century. Uh, the last time they qualified for a tournament was the 1998 uh, World Cup in France. Uh, Connor, let's take a look at the rankings uh, of each team. Yeah, uh, England are ranked fourth in the world according to FIFA and are eighth according to the ELO ranking system. Uh, England have held a top five FIFA ranking since December 2018 um, and are actually at their highest point since 2011. Uh, Croatia are 11th in the world, according to FIFA, and a bit lower at 16th, um, according to the ELO system. Uh, In the immediate aftermath of their successful World Cup campaign, uh, they reached 4th in FIFA and 8th in ELO. Um, They were as low as 26th and 18th uh, in the two systems two years before the World Cup. So that World Cup obviously had a huge impact uh, on their rankings. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to comment when I have something to say, but you're, you're doing great. Czech Republic, um, they're ranked 42nd by FIFA, but 31st by ELO, so, so several places higher there. Um, there's a 30-team gap between Croatia and Czech Republic if, the, if you use the FIFA rankings, but that gap is cut in half uh, based on the ELO system, so it really depends what system you're looking at there. Um, Czech Republic broke the top 20 uh, in June 2015 in FIFA rankings, but uh, they've been in the 40s in FIFA and the 30s in ELO for most of the past three or four years. Um, Their high point uh, was reaching second in the FIFA rankings heading into the 2006 FIFA World Cup. I remember that because I I, kind of picked them as outside uh, winners there. That didn't go, that didn't happen. (laughs) No, it didn't. <laughs> and then finally, Scotland. Uh, they're 48th and 45th in the two ranking systems, 
and are actually one of the lowest ranked teams heading into the tournament. Um, their high point in recent in the recent decade was was reaching 28th in FIFA and 33rd in ELO, uh, which they achieved in June 2015. Right, and uh, yeah, they've really been up and down because they were seventy uh, fourth in FIFA in June two thousand and thirteen, uh, and up to fourteenth in uh, December two thousand and seven, six years earlier. So they really bounce around a lot. Okay, do you want to uh, take us through the odds next? Yeah, this is uh, looking at the odds to win the group. Um, England are the favourites. Um, Croatia are a bit of a ways back, uh, perhaps somewhat surprisingly. Um, Czech Republic and Scotland are then quite a bit further behind both those teams. Um, they're given similar odds, but uh, slightly favouring the Czech Republic. So what do you think about that, Kevin? Do you, do you see England as being the clear favourites to win the group, as the odds makers seem to? Uh, I don't know. I mean, England in their qualification form, yes. England in their deer-in-the-headlights uh, tournament form, I'm not so sure. How about you? Yeah, I see it uh, being competitive. We'll, we'll talk about that towards the end of the podcast. But, um, you know, Croatia did beat England in the World Cup in 2018. So I, I think that suggests that these teams are, are evenly matched at best. Oh, okay. Well, that's uh, going to lead to an interesting conversation because uh, I'm kind of seeing the bottom three as closer than the odds suggest there. All right. Do you want to take us through the head-to-head -head records? Yeah, you kind of uh, led us into it by mentioning the um, uh, by mentioning uh, England and Croatia, of course, in 2018 uh, in the World Cup uh, semi-final. Uh, Croatia beat England in extra time. And uh, you can see on the graphic that their record is 3-0 and 3. So they have an even record uh, from 2004 when they first met in competition. Uh, interestingly, in the 2008 Euro Cup qualifying, uh, Croatia won twice and knocked England out. Uh, and for revenge in the 2010 World Cup qualifying, England won 4-1 uh, and 5-1 to return the favour back to Croatia, knocking them out. Interesting. So, yeah, pretty interesting there. Uh, England and Czech Republic have an even record too. The only time they've actually met was in qualifying for this tournament. Uh, England won the home leg 5-0, uh, but uh, lost the away leg. Their only loss in qualifying uh, was to the Czech Republic. So... Um, yeah, they're also uh, dead even. Uh, England and Scotland, uh, it seems, seems like they haven't played enough. I'm sure they played more than nine games in their history. Anyway, in major tournament, only nine games in their history. Uh, England is up five wins, two ties and two losses. Uh, 1968, uh, Scotland bested them. Um, and in 2018 World Cup qualifying, uh, England won the first leg, but they tied 2-2 in the away leg. Um, <clears throat> yeah, okay, Crow, moment, yeah, go ahead. A moment there, Kev. Um, England and Scotland have met many times in, in informal competitions or, or in, in tournaments organized among the home nations of, uh, you know, England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, and Northern Ireland. But uh, yeah, in informal World Cup qualifying and Euro qualifying, um, and the tournaments is what we're looking at here, which is why why they only have uh, nine kind of competitive meetings. Yeah, uh, that that makes sense. I was a bit taken aback because that didn't seem to be uh, that didn't seem to be enough. Uh, sorry, I just didn't uh, locate the information for uh, the next one. Uh, Croatia and uh, uh, Czech Republic have only played the one time and uh just let me get myself oriented here um yeah that was in 2016 in the uh, group stage of the euro cup uh where they tied uh two two um czech republic and scotland uh czech republic have the edge there three wins and one loss one tie and one loss 
And uh, last time they played was in 2012, and uh, the the uh, the uh, 2012 qualifying campaign was where they tied. And uh, finally, Scotland and Croatia. Uh, believe it or not, Scotland have the better record there. Um, they tied each other both in 2002 World Cup qualifying and in 2014 World Cup qualifying. Uh, Scotland won both legs. What do you make of that, Connor? Quite surprising. Uh, Scotland not in a particularly strong period in their history uh, in 2014. So, uh, yeah, undefeated against Croatia. Definitely a, a surprise there. Yeah, and Croatia losing at home in itself is a surprise. Uh, let's go down to look at uh, each of the countries here. Uh, let's start with England. Uh, can you take us through that? Yeah, none of the teams in this group are, are particularly large countries, at least geographically. Um, England, though, have 56 million people, um, which is actually two and a half times the size of the other teams in their group combined. Um, so by far uh, the largest country here. Um, yeah, nicknamed uh, the Three Lions. Three England. Lions. Do you hear them called uh, Three Lions that much? Oh, yes. Yeah, it goes back to their to their crest. Um, not sure why they, they've chosen lions, a country that, or an animal that doesn't uh, exist in England, but it's a long part of the heraldry. Um, but they'll, they'll benefit um, from playing many of their games at, at Wembley and uh, possibly from having a partisan crowd to support them. Right. We haven't really talked about the venues. Uh, maybe we'll save that for uh, a later, uh, maybe the last um, uh, entry here. How about Croatia? Croatia have just, just over 4 million people. Um, so they're doing extremely well at the moment to be competing um, you know, against much larger countries. Um, they're actually the third smallest um, country competing in the Euros only ahead of North Macedonia and, and Wales. Um, so, yeah, with just 4 million people, for them to have put in such a strong performance at the last World Cup and beaten some teams much, much larger than them, um, really quite impressive and really underscores their achievements um, currently and also historically as well. Yeah, sorry, on the graphic there, I say they're 4.7 million, but the uh, 2020 census says 4.05 million. So I don't know if that means the country is uh, getting smaller in population or whether just the numbers are wrong. But uh, their nickname is the Blazers, the Fiery Ones, or the Checkered Ones. I haven't heard any of that, but I've certainly seen the Checkered Ones. Absolutely, yeah, hard to miss. Yeah, they're red and white checkers. Uh, Czech Republic is the only team I've run across so far that has no nickname. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Yeah, Czech Republic have uh, have nearly 11 million people. Um, so they're the second largest country in the group. Um, and they're 15th overall among uh, UEFA countries. Um, so kind of um, middle of Europe, kind of close to the middle of the pack for uh, for population. Um, but yeah, find themselves as the second largest in this particular group. All right. And now let's go over to uh, Scotland. Uh, not as good a graphic here, but you can see where it is in Europe. Yes. Scotland, uh, the, the Highlanders or the Tartan Army, um, they can draw on 5.5 million people. Um, so that's kind of uh, right in the middle for, for European countries. Um, but on the smaller end of those competing uh, in this tournament. Right. And do you often hear them called by those nicknames? The Tartan Army, I hear more referring to their fans, um, which uh, which follow them around. Um, oh, okay. But, yeah, they yeah. also benefit from uh, being a host venue for this tournament. Oh, okay. Well, they haven't been in a tournament for so long. That's, I guess, why I haven't uh, heard any broadcasters really talk about uh those things that much. Let's uh, move on to part two of the podcast. If you're finished, uh, Connor. Yeah, get us started with part two, the, the team by team uh, analysis. All right. Well, we're going to start with England, which is a bit long because they have a long history. Um, and uh, they are the oldest soccer nation, but strangely not a senior team in the World Cup. 
Uh, the game was invented in England, and what is considered the first international match was played between England and Scotland, two teams in this group, uh, in 1872. Uh, before 1950, in 1928, actually, they had a dispute with FIFA and refused to join the World Cup and played instead with the uh, Home Nations teams, which uh, uh, was a competition called the British Home Championship. They reconciled with FIFA in 1946 and then have participated every time since 1950, along with the other British teams. Uh, in the Euro Cup, they missed the first edition in 1960, but participated regularly after that. And though they're seen as a dominant power for most of their history, they've only won one major competition, which was, Connor? 1966. And yeah. burned into the memory of all English fans, um, that being the World Cup in the year they hosted it. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so their first cup was in 1950, and it was uh, pretty inauspicious. But uh, I'm going to put the brakes on there and go back a little further. Uh, because they considered their first World Cup to be a game in 1934 against Italy, uh, who had won the World Cup in 1934. Uh, Italy turned the match the real World Cup because they considered themselves, uh, not without merit, I suppose, to be the best team in the world. And we're going to see that strain of arrogance run uh, throughout their history. Uh, the game became known as the Battle of Highbury, another battle, Connor. Just like uh, Portugal and Netherlands, which we talked about in a previous show. Yeah, exactly. And uh, this one included several broken bones. Uh, one of them was early on to the foot of an Italian defender, uh, Luis Monti, uh, which played a big part in England going up 3 nothing just 12 minutes in. I think he was a central defender. 3-0, uh, 12 minutes in. Italy rallied in the second half. Uh, with Italian great uh, Giuseppe Miazza scoring twice, but England won uh, in what a young Stanley Matthews, we'll hear his name again soon, he's one of the England greats, he described it as the most violent game of his career. Now, Stanley Matthews, who I just mentioned, played a role, or rather he didn't play a role in that inauspicious 1950 World Cup. Uh, despite being their best player and a veteran by now, he was not fielded in their second game against the USA. Uh, England had won over Chile in their opener, so it, it could be because the USA seemed a very small threat. Uh, but the problem was that substitutes were, substitutions were not part of the game yet. If, if you had an injured player, like in that Battle of Highbury, when that defender uh, went off, you couldn't replace him even if it was a, a foul, you know. So uh, they couldn't field him as they were losing the game one nothing to the USA, and the USA uh, fiercely clung on to their one nothing lead and, and won the game by that score. So some newspapers in England reported the score as a 10-1 win for England, thinking uh, uh, couldn't be possible, it must be a mistake. The news was coming from across the ocean in Brazil, so they couldn't really verify it. But it turned out that it was true. Uh, USA had won, and England lost their third game in the group to Spain, uh, also by one nothing, and they were out, despite being the heavy favorites for the tournament. Uh, they didn't do a lot better in future tournaments. They reached the quarterfinals at best, and not even that in 1958. Sorry, I should be showing uh, the uh, the historical graphic here. <coughs> uh, they nevertheless had high hopes for 1966, which they hosted. Uh, they tied their first game with Uruguay, but then they won all their games after that. Quarterfinal was with Argentina, and uh, that started a history of controversy between England and Argentina because one of the South Americans was sent off for the look on his face just wow. 35 minutes in. Uh, England won that game, won nothing, and then went to the final with Germany or uh, eventually got to the final with Germany, uh, which is a classic match. Germany scored in the 19th, 90th minute to equalize and bring the game to uh, extra time. 
And then at 101 minutes, Jeffrey Hurst took a shot, which hit the underside of the crossbar and went straight down and then bounced back out. Uh, that video is available on YouTube. Have you seen it, Connor? I haven't, but I'll go looking for it now. Oh, okay. It's a pretty famous clip. Even today, it's impossible to tell with the naked eye if it was uh, if it was in or not. Uh, I think it's been determined that it wasn't in. But of course, uh, Germans, the Germans felt the awarding of the goal was more because of home advantage. Uh, amazingly, in 2010, and I don't know if you remember this, a freakishly similar occurrence took place with, I think it was Frank L Lampard taking a shot. Indeed. Huh? It was indeed Frank Lampard. I do remember that. You remember that? Yeah. <laughs> it hit the crossbar and bounced straight down. Unbelievably uh, similar to that uh, goal in 1966, except this one, they had technology and uh, they determined that it wasn't the goal. Uh, quite amazing. Okay, uh, we'll jump to uh, a quarterfinal exit in 1970, was followed by a shameful new uh, two non-qualifications, and the results remained pretty unimpressive for England. Uh, you might remember 1986, a quarterfinal loss to Argentina with Diego Maradona's famous goals. Do you remember that, Connor? Right. Don't remember, but... One, one called the hand of God and one called the goal of the century. Yeah, I looked at that hand of God video today. It actually features a pretty, uh, a pretty good dribble uh, by him. And it's a quirky goal because uh, it was actually a defender trying to clear the ball, uh, but the ball kind of lobbed up uh, right toward the goalie and Maradona, a pretty short guy, jumped up and and managed to get it in uh, with his hand, as it turned out. The, the defenders were well aware of that and complained to the referee, but uh, to no avail. And then the second was an amazing run from his own half uh, through England's defence. So both of those goals have become classics. Um, it took until 1990 to get a result to be proud of. Um, that was a fourth-place finish, uh, which the English... Uh, were satisfied with both then and in 2018 even though if you think about it a fourth place finish entails losing your last two games uh, 1998 featured another famous game with argentina where david beckham uh, their star earned a red card uh, i watched that video today too uh, a minor but but it was a retaliation to a really rough foul on him and in the end, England lost that game on penalties. Uh, manager Glenn Hoddle famously saying that he hadn't practiced penalties because there was no way to prepare for that kind of pressure. Uh, okay, we'll move to the, to the new century. They failed to qualify again in 2002. And in 2006, they were knocked out by Portugal in the quarterfinal. Uh, this too was a bit famous. Uh, Wayne Rooney got red carded a decision which seemed to be influenced by his Manchester United teammate, Connor. Cristiano Ronaldo. Who winked over to the bench when the, when the deed was done. Uh, pretty, pretty impish of him. In 2010, they fell to Germany in the quarterfinal. And in 2014, failed to pass the, the group stage, the tricky Uruguayan uh, Luis, Luis Suarez, playing a role in their downfall there. Uh, so 2018 uh, became their third uh, their third finish in the top four. Well, the, the title in 1966 and then two fourth place finishes. Uh, that's a, a long history of uh, England, but uh, a pretty interesting one. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so we'll continue, uh, take a quick look at their qualifying. We won't look at all of them because uh, that would be too long. Uh, they failed to reach the World Cup three times. That was twice in a row in the, in the 1970s and then again in 1994. I think I made a mistake earlier and said they didn't qualify in 2002, but uh, that should be... Uh, 1994 was the last time they didn't qualify. Uh, 1974 is a poor campaign with just them and Poland and Wales in the qualifying group. Uh, after a win in Wales, they tied both home games 
and lost in Poland uh, to finish behind them. Poland was a pretty good team that year. Uh, 1978 was a heartbreak. Uh, they won all the games except for, except for a loss in Italy and went out on goal difference. Uh, they beat Luxembourg only 2 nothing, and, of course, Italy beat them by much more. So uh, went through on goal difference. Uh, 1982 was unconvincing, losing three of their four away games. But uh, in most other campaigns, they were pretty dominant and often going undefeated. Uh, 1994, the last time they didn't qualify, they were beaten out by Norway, uh, who actually topped the group ahead of Netherlands. Uh, both of those northern countries went through. And... Uh, <laughs> yeah, in 2002, they actually did well, finishing first over Germany and forcing Germany to qualify through a playoff. Um, they lost the opening game to Germany at, uh, there at home. They lost at home, but they thrashed Germany 5 nothing away. Uh, sorry, 5-1 away. And in qualification since, they've lost at most one game and not even that in the last two qualifying campaigns. Whew, that is the long World Cup history of England. Any comments, Connor? Are you going to take us through the uh, recent stuff? No, it was an excellent summary. Um, I'll just briefly talk about their, their 2018 World Cup, which was their best showing at a World Cup in a generation. Um, and it was seen actually as a bit of a surprise as they entered the tournament with a relatively young and inexperienced team. Um, despite their success, they actually lost three games in the tournament, um, twice to Belgium, uh, both in the group stage and in the third place match, and then also to Croatia in the semifinal after extra time. Uh, their wins came against Tunisia and Panama in the group stage, and then against Colombia, uh, finally breaking a penalty shootout curse, um, and then Sweden in the knockout rounds. Um, so that was their tournament in 2018. Um, pretty good tournament for them um and a lot now feel that it's something that they can build on yeah okay well their euro cup record is uh, quite a bit shorter than the world cup uh, uh story uh they're less convincing in all respects in their euro cup record having not entered the first edition in 1960 they failed to qualify for uh three of the next four uh however they did the one they did qualify for in 1968 led to their best finish in the euro cup which was their third excuse me third place so that poor record continued over the next four editions to 1992 uh where at, at the most they passed the group stage uh and they didn't even qualify in 1984. In fact, uh, over that period, they won only one out of nine games in the process, uh, including losing all three games in 1988. Uh, once again, hosting uh, brought them uh, some fortune, uh, brought them out of this slump uh, with a semi-final finish there, and uh, they've passed the group stage four out of the last six times. So even with that, though, their recent history has not been impressive uh, in the Cup. They once again failed to reach the Cup in 2008, and they've only ever gone one step beyond the group stage uh, when they've passed it, which is uh, uh, the quarterfinals, but uh, now that the tournament has expanded the round of 16. Uh, when they have qualified, though, it's been quite convincing in the period from 1980 to 1992 mentioned above, that's the period where they only won one out of their nine games in the group stage of the tournament. Get this, Connor. They only lost two of their 28 games in qualifying. Wow. What a stark difference. Yeah. So does that sound familiar to you, doing well in qualifying and then getting to the cup and not doing well? Perhaps a bit of their, their story of England, really. Yeah, uh, that pattern continued and it is the reason why 2008 is the only time since 1984 that they didn't qualify. So in 2008, uh, they uncharacteristically lost their last two games away to second place Russia and then at home to winners Croatia, who they meet here. And they would have qualified had they won either of those games. And uh, believe it or not, since 2008, they are undefeated in qualifying. 
Yeah, very good qualification record, but um, have been a little bit uninspiring in, in tournaments. Um, Euro 2020 or Euro 2012, sorry. Um, after they topped the group that included France, Ukraine, and Sweden, they lost to Italy uh, in penalties in the first knockout round. Um, in Euro 2016, they finished second in their group behind Wales, uh, who they actually beat, but then they could only manage draws against uh, Russia and Slovakia. Um, the most memorable thing about their tournament, of course, was their shock 2-1 loss to Iceland in the round of 16. Um, you may recall that they took the lead inside four minutes, but were 2-1 down less than 15 minutes later and were never able to recover, um, and that's how the game finished. Uh, thus, my dear in the headlight comments, which will uh, flash out a little bit here with some general comments, because I feel that their uh, psychological state has been more defining uh, than their record. And uh, whenever I whenever I read or listen to something about England, um, you know, uh, there, there's a kind of a mix of this unjustifiable arrogance they have. Uh, combined with this uh, kind of pressure and nervousness that they feel, so uh, I was struck uh, in their two in their, I think it was 2018 uh, bid for the World Cup when they came up with the slogan "Football's coming home," and I thought, oh my God, you know. <laughs> fortunately, they rejected it and didn't use it. But things like not practicing penalties uh, in the shootout and stuff like that just these little signs of kind of overconfidence. But then uh, I find that when they get to the cup, they're, I don't know what it is. They're so flat and they feel stifled and uh, sometimes don't seem to know what to do on the pitch. Do you have any comments on that? No, I agree entirely. Um, yeah, the the expectations um, that English fans and, and perhaps especially the media have of their team isn't really based on any um, track record of success at tournaments. In fact, I think in 2018, expectations going into the tournament were uncharacteristically low um, with the new manager and lots of young players. And that may have significantly helped their cause um, as there wasn't as much pressure on them going into that tournament. Of course, that good performance has lifted expectations once again. Uh, so coping with that pressure will be a re reality for them uh, this time around. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, uh, being as satisfied with they are with fourth place, I mean, do you think Germany, Brazil, big teams like that are satisfied with fourth place? Not at all. And, I mean, England's Lone World Cup win came in 1966. I mean, that's quite a long time ago, whereas teams like Italy... France, Spain, Brazil, Argentina, a number of countries have won it since then. And, and England, you know, the, they haven't even come home in, uh, with a medal since then. So um, they certainly see themselves as one of the great and dominant teams in world football. But you have to, taking a good look at the record, you kind of wonder where that comes from. I mean, part of it comes from, uh, you know, like in 1950 and in recent tournaments, say this tournament we're going into. I mean, they go in with really good players who, uh, you know, they don't seem to show their stuff when they get there, but they, they do go in with a lot of talent. Yeah, and obviously they have a very strong domestic league, um, but that that clearly isn't correlated with... Um, with success for the national team. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, all of England is hoping that it will this time. Let's take a look at how they got there. And uh, no surprising, as I said in their in their history, their qualifying record looks like this all the time. Uh, and even that one splash of red, a loss to the Czech Republic, uh, is fairly rare. Otherwise, they won all games. But uh, a pretty easy group corner. Yeah, it was a group you'd expect them to win. But as you said, it, it's been true to form. Um, they tend to win seven out of eight, nine out of ten games, sometimes winning winning all of them in qualification. Yeah, look at some of those scores there. Six nothing, seven nothing. Uh, Czech Republic got that winning goal at 85. Yeah, uh, 
a uh, goal difference of plus 31 after just eight games is pretty remarkable. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Let's take a look at the, uh, at the uh, recent history here, the uh, last couple of years. Yeah. England won their uh, league, a nation's league group in 2018, 19 ahead of Spain and current group mates, Croatia. Uh, they advanced to the final four, um, but lost to Netherlands in the semifinals before uh, beating Switzerland in the third place playoff. Uh, they were unable to follow that up with uh, uh, success in the 2020 slash 2021 Nations League, uh, where they finished behind Belgium and level on points with Denmark. Um, 2022 World Cup qualifying, though, is off to a good start. Um, three wins from three against San Marino, Albania, and then a 2-1 home win against Poland, um, who are likely to be their nearest challengers in that group, um, have, have set them off well and perhaps en route to another very strong qualification campaign. Yeah, uh, uh, it would be surprising if they didn't make it with England. It's all about what they do once they get there. Uh, let's take a look at who is going to be there once they get there. Uh, of course, uh, Harry Kane getting 12 of their goals, 12 of their 37 goals. Um, uh, take it away, Connor. Yeah, no real surprise. He was the Golden Boot winner at the at the FIFA World Cup and just won a Golden Boot in the Premier League as well. He has a remarkable record of, of 34 goals in 53 games for England. One thing I think that's interesting, of their 10 scorers in 2020 qualifying... Five of the players are not in the provisional team for the tournament. Um, that includes Ross Barkley, Michael Keane, uh, Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, Tammy Abraham, and Harry Winks. Um, so I think one feature of England is is that they they do look to bring in a lot of players. Um, they really rotate and, and seem to go really who's in good form at the moment as opposed to selecting a core of players to make up the national team. So there's yeah. a lot of players coming into the tournament who don't actually have a lot of caps for England. Uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, I, I, I know what you mean on the one hand, and that's one of the problems with some of these bigger teams, maybe not Spain, uh, uh, is, yeah, a balance between, you know, having 11 different players on the field all the time uh, as opposed to the same players on the field and... Um, but I, I do know from my own watching of the Premier League this year that those players you mentioned have really fallen out of the public eye. Yeah, it's an interesting dilemma for, for Gareth Southgate. I think there has to be some sort of balance. Um, but you're right, you don't want to stick with players who aren't playing regularly, which, which was the case for a number of those players that I mentioned. Yeah, let's take a look at their recent scorers in the uh, 2002, and I guess some of these are the guys who will be uh, who who will be there. Harry, Harry Maguire won't; he's injured, uh, but some of the scorers have been replaced. Yeah, Dominic Calvert Lewin, James Ward Prowse, Ollie Watkins. These are some of the players who've come into the team more recently, but uh, have made a good impression so far. Great. Well, we spent a lot of time on England. I think we should move on to Croatia. What do you think? Yeah, Croatia, the second team in the group. Take it away, Kev. Okay, thanks. Well, Croatia, uh, Yugoslavia, which Croatia was part of before 1992, had a long and fearsome, uh, though intermittent, reputation as a soccer country. It's actually Serbia who is the... Um, uh, kind of the biggest part of uh, Yugoslavia, but since they're not in this tournament, I'm going to do a little bit of the history of Yugoslavia uh, under the umbrella of Croatia. So uh, they, uh, meaning Yugoslavia, entered every World Cup and Euro Cup uh, and did particularly well in the early years. In the World Cup, they reached the quarterfinals five times and the semifinals twice, including the first World Cup in 1930. They took second place in two of the first three Euro Cups in the 1960s. Uh, and despite some strong showings in 1976 Euro and 1990 uh, World Cup, though, they were less of a force from the 1970s on. 
So, uh, as I said, that, that reputation probably belongs more to Serbia. Uh, however, I think Croatia, and I, I, I can't confirm this, but I think uh, Croatia con uh, contributed more than their uh, regular share of players to the Yugoslav team. Uh, certainly, they've done the best out of all those Yugoslavian uh, countries. Uh, it should be noted also that they played some games as a semi-independent nation in 1918-19 and in 1941-45 during the war. And technically their first official games may be cited during those periods. Uh, okay, they weren't able to make it to the 1994 World Cup after declaring independence. And by they, I mean Croatia now. Uh, they declared independence in 1992, uh, didn't get it organized enough to make the 1994 World Cup, but they stormed into third place in the 1998 World Cup. However, like uh, Yugoslavia before the breakup, they really waver in consistency and strength. So since 1998, they had never made it beyond the group stage and failed to even reach the cup in 2010, despite obvious talent. However, as you know, they rose again to finish second in the, in the 2018 World Cup. In World Cup qualification, uh, they had not lost a qualifica uh, qualification game between 19, uh, from 1998 until 2010, uh, when they lost two games to England. Uh, however, numerous ties in qualifying and poor performances in the Cup make them seem less than a world-class team. In 2014, they absolutely crumbled at the end. Uh, sorry, you're probably going to talk about that. No, go ahead. Oh, okay. They, uh, I think they won their first four games, and then they, they got a point or two out of their last four games, uh, uh, which after England in 2010 were their only losses ever at home in qualifying. So their sterling home record became even more tainted. Uh, sorry, uh, they didn't lose at home after that, but they have a good qualifying record. Um, but that sterling record became more tainted uh, when they finished second behind Iceland and had to qualify through a playoff uh, for 2018. And uh, it really was a staggering run to that final in 2018. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think their, their trip to the World Cup final deserves a bit of a stroll down memory lane. Um, it was an uninspiring qualifying campaign, as you said. They, they needed to rely on the playoffs. But at the World Cup, they stormed out of the gates. Uh, they won all three group stage games um, against Nigeria, uh, Argentina, who they beat 3-0, and then Iceland, who had finished ahead of them in their qualifying group. Uh, their run in, their knock, in the knockout stage saw them face only European opposition. And in each victory up until the final, at least, their games were tied after 90 minutes. Uh, penalties took them past Denmark and again against host Russia in the quarterfinals. Um, then they met England in the semis, and it was an extra time goal that put them into their first World Cup final. Um, against France in the final, they conceded the first first goal, but soon equalized. Um, they conceded a penalty to go to halftime down 2-1, um, and they were never able to recover from that. Um, the game finished 4-2 to France, uh, but they returned to Croatia uh, as heroes. It was um, a hugely celebrated moment for the country. You're on mute there, Kev, but I'll let you... Uh, go forward with the Euro history. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, I do want to add one thing to that 2018 thing. Uh, I remember talking to you and we were looking at the brackets on each side and uh, the bracket that Croatia and England were on was very gentle and the other side was very brutal. So we really thought uh, uh, England had a good chance to get to the final through through that bracket. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. Like you said, Denmark, Russia were the teams they faced. Um, France had to overcome Argentina, um, Belgium, a Belgium side which knocked out Brazil. Um, so, yeah, it was really um, a little bit uh, disproportionate, but 
still somebody had to take advantage of it and create yeah. where they need to do so. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and good for them for doing that. Uh, let's take a look at Euro Cup history. Their greatest result in the 1998 World Cup was hinted at by a quarterfinal finish in the 1996 Euro Cup, uh, which was their first tournament as a nation. Uh, they didn't qualify in 2000 and only reached the group stage in 2004, but they have not failed to qualify since then, and they passed the group stage in 2008 and in 2016. Uh, in 2008, they impressively won all group stage games, including a win over Germany, who was pretty poor that year. But uh, they fell to Turkey on penalties in a thrilling quarterfinal match, which I think I mentioned when we talked about Turkey. Uh, yeah, they looked... Oh, sorry. No, yeah, we, we touched on that in Group A. Yeah, that's right. Uh, they looked strong in uh, 2016, beating Spain and topping the group over defending champions, uh, over the defending champions, Spain, but they lost to Portugal in extra time of the semi-final. So their undefeated home record in qualifying remains intact in Euro Cup qualification, uh, even in 2000, which was the only time they failed to qualify. But uh, too many ties have undermined them, and that, uh, together with an inconsistent road record, it's sometimes the reason they finish second and have to qualify through a playoff. They beat Slovenia in 2004, uh, where they started the qualifying campaign with a home draw against Estonia, and in 2012, where they tied group winner Greece at home and had to win a playoff against Turkey to reach the cup. So their road record remained suspect, even in the last two qualification campaigns, uh, even though they qualified directly in, in the last two campaigns. Yeah, I'll just talk about their, a little bit about their recent history in the tournament. Um, they topped their group at the 2016 Euros, as you mentioned, finishing ahead of Spain, as well as Turkey and the Czech Republic, who they meet again here. Um, having topped their group, they were then given the advantage of being matched up uh, in the round of 16 against a team that finished uh, their group in third place. But that team happened to be Portugal. <laughs> Who um, tied all three of their group stage games, right? Right. So, yeah, they met uh, Portugal in the re uh, in the quarterfinals, um, or sorry, in the round of 16. Um, and they did take the eventual champions all the way as you mentioned there, Kev, losing in an extra time goal just uh, three minutes from time. Yeah, but they won the tournament, Portugal. And uh, if we're talking about staggering towards a final, uh, Portugal in 2016 uh, is an example. Uh, well, in general comments, they've qualified for all the recent tournaments, except in 2010 when uh, England got revenge on them for, for knocking England out in 2008. Uh, they hadn't gotten out of the group stage of the World Cup since their impressive third place finish in 1998. Uh, but uh, they had passed two of the four group stages in the uh, Euro Cup. So, uh, yeah, uh, uh, sorry, just a, a generally a very uh, up and down team, which uh, is kind of the way Yugoslavia was, kind of coming with full strength and... Uh, and then dropping off. Do you feel they've dropped off since that World Cup uh, uh, final? Yeah, we'll look at some of their recent performances right away. Um, but as you said, they've they've been regular qualifiers for the Euros, but uh, performance in the tournaments have been inconsistent. Um, hopefully, they for them uh, they can carry some of their form in uh, from the World Cup. Obviously, that's raised expectations now. So well. Whereas sometimes, um, you know, they just got out of the group stage. I think there there will be um, a bit more expectation for them to go a little bit deeper in the tournament. Yeah. Okay, well, let's move on to the uh, Euro Cup. And sorry about that. I didn't have the, uh, the uh, Euro Cup history there when I was talking about it. But this is what we're talking about uh, exactly with uh, Croatia. Fabulous home record in qualifying for this tournament. They won all games. And uh, quite poor on the road there, too many ties, uh, and the loss being to Hungary 
you know, not not one of the stronger teams in that group. Uh, but they did manage to finish uh, first in a fairly competitive group there. Yeah, for, a draw on the yeah. road to Azerbaijan uh, standing out among those results. Yeah, it's kind of hard to believe they finished first with that record, I got to say. Yeah. Uh, um, take us... Yeah. In Do Nations want... League play, Croatia have not yeah. performed particularly well. They've actually only won two of their ten matches um, across two tournaments in League A. Uh, they survived relegation on goal difference um, most recently after they and Sweden posted identical records of one win and five losses um, in a group that also included France and Portugal. Um, World Cup qualifying got off to a, a bit of a rocky start with a 1-0 loss away to Slovenia. However, home wins followed against Cyprus and Malta. Uh, they sit joint top of the group after three games, but have argu arguably played the three weakest teams in the group um, and have yet to be tested by Russia or Slovakia. Yeah, they seem to have a thing about uh, getting off to poor starts. So fifth place there after the first game. And I mentioned that uh, home tie with uh, Estonia in one of their qualifications. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at some of their players. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, I got a little uh, stat for you here. There are only three players in Europe who have played all of their games all of their teams' games, usually 21 games, uh, since the beginning of 2019. And uh, one of them is on this list. Any guess, Connor? I'm going to go with the obvious and guess Luka Modric. Is that is that who it is? Uh, that's a good guess, but no, it's Ivan uh, Perisic, uh, um, who, who I, I find to be a really outstanding figure on the team, very consistent player. <laughs> Yeah, I think most of their, their 2018 squad is still around. Um, Luka Modric, Ivan Perisic, Mateo Kovacic. Um, so they're, they're really going to this tournament with a lot of similar players that took them uh, into the World Cup. Yeah, so they could be good in terms of, uh, in, in terms of teamsmanship. It's ironic, I, I said, Perisic is one of their most consistent players when he missed a penalty there, but <laughs> he really is. Uh, their recent scorers, uh, uh, same Perisic and Modric among them. Do you know any of uh, those other guys, especially uh, the top scorer here, Bruno Petkovic? Yeah, he was their top scorer in qualifying, just four goals, so so the goals were spread out. Uh, he actually uh, plays domestically for Dinamo Zagreb. Um, there's still a couple of players on the Croatian team uh, who do play in the domestic league. Uh, many with Dinamo Zagreb, who are the uh, the local powerhouse. Cool, great. Well, that is uh, Croatia, and uh, it's time we move on to the Czech Republic. Okay, uh, let's take a look. Uh, uh, they also have a kind of a, a team uh, in the past, of course, Czechoslovakia. Uh, Czechoslovakia was a team with a strong but intermittent record in soccer. Uh, they first entered in 1934, making them a senior team. And uh, sorry, I'm going to move the graphic to the right place here. Um, and they participated consistently, although they didn't make the uh, World Cup in 1950. They entered all the Euro Cups from its beginnings in 1960. So they took second place in their first World Cup in 1934. And then they managed to do that again in 1962. Uh, beyond that, though, they only qualified about half the time and only two in six times between 1974 and uh, 1994. So when they did, they uh, when they did qualify, they were knocked out of the group stage four of the six times and they reached the quarterfinals the, the other two times in 1938 and 1990. Uh, the Czech Republic has proven weaker as far as the World Cup goes. Uh, they have qualified only once since uh, 1998. Uh, that was 2006, where you mentioned they were a very promising squad, uh, but they, they were knocked out at the group stage. Uh, since then, they finished third in qualifying uh, behind Slovakia and Slovenia in 2010, 
uh, Denmark in 2014 and behind Northern Ireland in 2018. I think you have a bit more to say about that campaign. Yeah, uh, just going back to 2014, um, they were in a group with Italy and Denmark, but they were unable to beat either of those top two teams, uh, which condemned them to a third place finish. Um, in 2018, um, they finished third behind Germany and Northern Ireland, as you mentioned. Um, they they won four of their 10 games, but two of those were against San Marino. Um, so it was really an underwhelming campaign um, and, and scoreless home draws with Northern Ireland and Azerbaijan uh, proved costly to them in, in what was uh, a disappointing campaign for them. Yeah, uh, looks like uh, uh, teams like Azerbaijan uh, are getting a little better and uh, the bigger teams need to be careful. Let's go to the uh, Euro Cup record. <laughs> the Euro Cup has uh, actually been the opposite with the Czech Republic uh, proving more consistent than Czechoslovakia did. Uh, Czechoslovakia had some good results though. Uh, they, hang on, I've lost my spot here. Uh, they won their third cup in 1960 there. And again in 1980, 1980, wait a minute. Yeah, that's correct. Third place both those years. Sorry, I thought they, oh yes, right. Uh, third place in those two years. And I was confused. They actually won the cup in 1976. Uh, but beyond those three results, they never qualified, although they usually came close. Uh, they left a record of three qualifications in nine, but uh, obviously good success when they got there. Uh, Czech Republic, though, has been better uh, on the whole. You might argue that. Uh, but uh, they've qualified every time from 1996. They won second place in that year, 1996, their first entry, where they beat France on penalties in the semi-final, but then lost to Germany in extra time of the final. Uh, otherwise, they've reached the semi-final in 2004 and the quarter-final in 2012. In 2008, uh, sorry, 2000, 2008 and 2016, they qualified but didn't pass the group stage. So they've qualified every time since 1996, uh, uh, twice qualifying over Netherlands and once over Germany. Pretty, uh, pretty impressive names there. Ironically, the only time they finished second and required a playoff uh, was the only recent tournament where they've passed the group stage. So their weakest qualification led to their best uh, recent result. So in summary, uh, Czech Republic's Euro record uh, is arguably better. Uh, sorry, their uh, Euro record is much better than their World Cup record. Uh, the opposite of Czechoslovakia, who did better in the World Cup um, than in the Euro Cup, despite uh, winning it that one time. What do you say, Connor? Yeah, interesting. In, in Euro 2012, where they did do well, um, they won their group ahead of host Poland, uh, Russia, and Greece, um, but lost to a Cristiano Ronaldo goal in their first knockout game. Um, they qualified for Euro 2016 by winning their group ahead of Iceland, Turkey, and the Netherlands. Um, as you mentioned, um, the Netherlands, of course, failing to qualify for the expanded tournament. And they actually beat the Dutch both home and away. So a really impressive qualification result. However, that promising campaign didn't translate to the finals as they picked up just a single point um, at the tournament. That came against Croatia, um, but they lost their other games to Spain and Turkey. Um, so yeah, consistent qualifiers, uh, like you said, a, a better qualification record and more consistent than even, even many stronger teams, um, but have yet to really make, uh, make their mark in, in the tournament over the last couple of years. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm surprised because uh, you commented on it last time. I think it was with uh, Austria, maybe. Uh, just the difference uh, some, of the, uh, some of these teams have in their World Cup record compared to their uh, Euro Cup record. Sometimes it's uh, really starkly different. Yeah, certainly the, the case here. Um, you know, absent from... from from most of the World Cup, for most of their history, and and a very interesting comparison, like you like you uh, went over with Czechoslovakia, who kind of had the opposite. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, they do fall to some weak teams like uh, Slovenia and Northern Ireland, so they give up. Uh, they give up points, and you know they they often have uh, uh, the look or the feel of a top team. I guess kind of like Yugoslavia, they kind of rise and fall like a tide. Um, but uh, some of the teams they lose to are also a bit surprising. Interestingly for this group, uh, in the 1970s, they, they came second behind Scotland in qualification, in World Cup qualification, two times in a row. Oh, interesting. And they meet them again here. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, we'll take a look at their World Cup qualification uh, and you can, uh, sorry, their qualification for this tournament. And uh, you can see their uh, winning record at home, uh, winning all games, including against England. That looks a little bit like Croatia, except whereas Croatia had a couple of ties on the road, uh, Czech Republic um, had losses to Kosovo and uh, Montenegro. Yeah, well, given their history of, of their qualification record not necessarily correlating to their tournament record, perhaps a poor qualification campaign could be a good omen for them. Yeah, uh, quite possibly. Yeah, they don't seem to correlate that well. Uh, let's take a look at recent matches, uh, Connor. Yeah, in the Nations League, Czech Republic have competed twice in League B, um, but most recently finished group winners to earn promotion to Group A. Um, there they met Scotland again, uh, as well as Israel and Slovakia. Um, in 20, uh, World Cup 2022 qualification, um, they started with a, a big 6-2 win against Estonia. Um, they earned a decent home draw against Belgium, but then lost to Wales on the road. Um, a tough loss for them as Wales and Czech Republic are, are likely to be the teams battling it out for second. Um, but as you can see with their recent record, it's it's kind of spotty. It's it's a couple wins. It's a couple losses. No real trend going into the tournament. How about in uh, the World Cup qualifying then? Oh, sorry. I I just touched oh. on that with the uh, with the matches again. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Okay, I wasn't uh, I wasn't following because I saw Wales uh, at the top of the uh, uh, of the other one too. I was a bit confused by that because uh, even though they were promoted in 2018 and 19 over Israel. Uh, they were in the same group as Israel in the uh, in the uh, next round. So I was trying to sort that out in my mind. It turns out that Israel got promoted along with them. Right. Uh, okay, let's take a look at uh, some of the players uh, here. And we see Patrick Schick is the main uh, scorer for them, uh, though not with a, a lot of their goals uh, spread out. Uh, Thomas Suchek will be familiar from uh, West Ham for, for players, people who follow the English league. Uh, how about the other players there, Connor? Yeah, goal scoring pretty spread out. Um, Thomas Schick, the only player to hit uh, double figures in or more than one goal in qualifying for this tournament. Um, he's a 25-year-old striker who plays for Bayer Leverkusen. Um, but he's already netted 10 times for his national side. So uh, a promising start to his uh, national career. Um, Thomas Suchek is another that you mentioned. Um, he scored a hat trick in that game I mentioned against Estonia in World Cup qualifying. Um, and is coming off an excellent season for West Ham. Yeah, One thing to note about Czech Republic. Sorry, Kev. Yeah, um, go ahead. Uh, a number of players who play domestically, um, as well as being spread out across Europe, um, most of them uh, playing for Slavia Prague. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. Play domestically, that is. Yeah, yeah, I see. Uh, Slavia Prague's not a bad team. No, they had a good run in this year's uh, UEFA, UEFA Cup, um, knocking out Leicester uh, in the process. Yeah, yeah, they've always been uh, uh, fairly decent, I think. There we see the uh, hat trick by Thomas uh, Suchak. He's he's a he's a defensive midfielder, isn't he? He does, but he has a habit of coming up with goals, especially off set pieces. He's a, he's a real threat. Yeah, he definitely uh, he definitely showed that this year. Uh, otherwise, not a lot to look at, but some of the same names. Yeah, not too much. Again, scoring a little bit spread out. 
Um, but why don't we move on to Scotland? Let's do that. Okay, uh, down to Scotland. Uh, their their uh, long history there. And uh, as I mentioned when I talked about England, uh, Scotland is uh, obviously uh, the uh, one of the oldest because they played England in what's considered the uh, first international game. Uh, but like all British teams, they didn't enter the World Cup in 1950. Uh, they qualified for that cup, but uh, strangely uh, withdrew, even though they had qualified. Uh, and the reason they gave was that they hadn't come first in the qualifying group. I, I just have the urge to say that in a Scottish accent, but I, I won't, I won't believe it. <laughs> Uh, they have uh, qualified for eight World Cups, uh, for eight World Cups, and uh, especially a long streak from 1974 to 1990, which is five cups in a row. However, uh, they haven't reached it uh, after 1998. So, as you said at the top of the cast, uh, haven't gotten there this century. And uh, they Euro Cup. Uh, oh, I should I should make it clear they. They haven't gotten beyond the first, the group stage either uh, in all of their eight qualifications. And the um, Euro Cup uh, record is far worse, qualifying for only a dish, only two Euro Cups, the last one being in 1996. So their World Cup appearances were a real exercise in frustration. Uh, they never got past the first round, but they came so close four of the eight times. Uh, they finished tied for second place. They they were in third, and they finished tied with the second place team for three cups in a row uh, in 1974 wow. with Brazil, 1978 with Netherlands, and 1982 with the USSR. How frustrating. Uh, since 2002, I've said they failed to qualify. So their qualifications or their failures to qualify don't bear a lot of mention, uh, beyond an interesting history with Czechoslovakia, uh, they meet Czech Republic here, so I thought I'd point it out. In 1962, they lost a playoff 4-2 in extra time. And uh, as I've mentioned before, they got their revenge by uh, uh, finishing ahead of them in the group twice in a row in 1970 and 1974. Uh, and they actually will meet again in Euro Cup action, uh, as I'll talk about soon. Uh, as the Czech Republic. In recent times, since 2002, they've finished third or fourth in their group every time. Uh, sorry, third in their group every time, except for 2014 when they finished fourth. And uh, in 2010, uh, they tied with second place finishers Norway. Uh, sorry, in 2010 and 2018, they tied uh, with second place finishers Norway and Slovakia, but in both cases, uh, the second place finisher didn't advance either, so they were far behind the winner. Go ahead, Connor, for the recent, uh, more recent uh, analysis. Yeah, in 2014 qualification, Scotland finished fourth of six teams, uh, winning three of ten games. However, they beat Croatia home and away, um, so an interesting record. Um, but they struggled against weaker teams uh, in the group like Wales and Macedonia. Interesting. Uh, Scotland improved somewhat in 2018 World Cup qualifying, uh, finishing joint second, as you mentioned. Um, a decent draw at home against England was unfortunately cancelled out by a home draw against a very poor Lithuania team, and that agonizingly cost them a place in the World Cup playoffs. Oh. Yeah, they, uh, they, they, they're, they're painful to be a fan of, I feel. Uh, Europe, uh, the Euro Cup record is much less impressive. Let me uh, scroll down to it for those of you watching a video cast. Uh, they didn't enter the first two cups, but they came just a point behind England in 1968. That was the last time they would come close, though, finishing third and fourth in their groups during what was a good period in World Cup qualification. Uh, as that World Cup form waned, uh, they reached their only two Cups, the only two Euro Cups, which were in 1992 and 1996. Uh, coming third 
uh, third in the group both times, but re-haunted in 1996 by finishing, tied on points with second place. And uh, goal difference, second place, uh, with the Netherlands, who, who had the same number of points and the same goal difference, and Netherlands won uh, by dint of scoring one more goal than Scotland did. How frustrating. In 2000, uh, Czechoslovakia, now playing as the Czech Republic, got their long-awaited revenge, condemning them to second place and a playoff with England, which Scotland lost. They lost a playoff to Netherlands in 2004, and from them grew uh, from that time grew even further away from reaching the cup, uh, finishing always third in their group, and then fourth in nineteen uh, sorry in two thousand and sixteen. Uh, two thousand and eight was a competitive campaign. They finished just two points behind second place France, and uh, a loss in Georgia in the second last game uh, proved their undoing. Yeah, you'll talk a bit about their qualification for this campaign. So I'll just talk briefly about 2016 qualifying. As is so often the case, a couple of good results tended to be cancelled out by a couple of poor ones. Um, a road draw against Poland was followed later on in qualifying by a defeat on the road to Georgia, whose only other points came against Minos Gibraltar. On the positive side, they were competitive against teams above them that year, um, including group winners Germany. And it perhaps pointed uh, to another solid, if ultimately fruitless, campaign uh, for the 2018 World Cup that followed. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, just to clarify that Georgia seems like a weak team and they weren't getting a lot of home points uh, at that team. But generally, they're quite fierce at home. And I think Scotland's lost more than once in Georgia. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to just kind of reiterate uh, what what you uh, what what you just said there. Um, on the individual game level, they can contend with anyone, and they've taken points off all the major teams, uh, including Brazil and Uruguay in the World Cups. Uh, we talked about them beating Croatia twice in 2014. Uh, they, you mentioned they tied England in 2018. Uh, however, their record of disappointing losses or ties to weak teams uh, is endless, including uh, Moldova, Estonia, and uh, twice tying Faroe Islands, one of the weakest teams in the region. Uh, they also have a penchant for losing key games to equal or better teams at critical points. Uh, any closing comments there on their overall history? No, not much to add. I think that sums it up quite well. All right, let's take a look at their qualifying for this cup then. Uh, well, not uh, very impressive, kind of all over the place, really. And wait, it looks like they finished third. I didn't think third place teams could qualify, Connor. Indeed, they couldn't. But as we talked about with North Macedonia, the back door, um, they qualified through the Nations League playoff. Um, so benefited from... Uh, from Path C and were able to qualify for the tournament that way. And talk about squeaking their way through. Uh, they finished a full nine points behind Russia in the in the uh, qualification tournament. And uh, then they won on penalties over uh, Israel and won again on penalties over Serbia. So I don't know whether to hand it to them or to consider them uh, really lucky. <laughs> Bit of both. Yeah, well, let's see if their recent record uh, can shed a little light on that. Yeah, a bit of an inconsistent um, recent record. Um, in their recent Nations League play, they finished second in a group behind the Czech Republic, who they meet again here. In typically Scottish fashion, they beat the Czech Republic twice, but then dropped points to weaker teams, winning just one of four matches against Israel and Slovakia. Um, so far, they're undefeated in World Cup qualifying, um, a home draw against Austria and an away draw against Israel were not bad results to start. Um, and they followed that up with a 4-0 win against the previously troublesome Faroe Islands. Um, but they will need to find ways to get wins if they hope to make it out of the group. Yeah, they got to do a little bit better than that if, uh, if they're going to make it. 
Uh, let's take a look at their uh, uh, scorers here. Uh, John McGinn, who uh, I think he was pretty prolific for Aston Villa last year, but not so much this year, getting seven goals. And then the rest were scored by a whole whack of uh, uh, get guys getting uh, one goal. I guess Ryan Christie got two. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit more about it? Yeah, uh, John McGinn led the way, as you said, and he's arguably the most important player for them, um, scoring goals and also uh, setting them up. Scotland have neither an outstanding goal scoring or defensive record, um, but you do wonder a little bit where goals will come from. Um, John McGinn is the only player in the provisional squad for this tournament um, to have reached doubles figures for the country, um, and even then he has just 10. Um so there's a lot of players who have been around but haven't necessarily scored loads of goals for the, for the national team. So I think that is potentially a concern for them heading into this tournament. Yeah, Andrew Robertson is a big name uh, for Liverpool, but he's a, a winger more than a scorer. He's a creator. Yeah, and has to do a bit more defending than he typically does uh, with Liverpool. Oh, okay. Uh, well, let's take a look at the more recent scorers because I think uh, Che Adams here, uh, Che Adams could uh, provide a bit of punch, do you think? A bit. Like like England, they seem to draft, uh, draft in a couple of players who are in good form. Che Adams finished the season strongly for Southampton. So he doesn't have a long history with the national team, but he will be somebody they'll be looking to um, to provide those those goals that they'll need. Great. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of part two, which is the long team by team uh, analysis. Uh, and now let's have a little bit of discussion about the uh, prospects of each team. Do you want to take it away, Connor? Yeah, I I do see um, a race for the top two um, between England and Croatia. Um, England don't have a fabulous record in the group stage over recent tournaments um and croatia looking to build on their 2018 world cup i do think it'll be it'll be quite close it could possibly come down to goal difference for for first place so i see i see england and croatia as competitive for the top two um and yeah i'd find it difficult to to potentially pick a winner how do you see it shaking down though yeah, I really do find it tough to be a winner. I feel like, you know, England really does have by far the most talented squad. And, you know, their qualifying is really impressive. They should be coming out of this group easily. But I'm kind of wor worried about the psychology on the field. And they they start, uh, they start playing like uh, elementary students, uh, just kicking the ball wherever you know they just seem to panic or, or something so if that happens to them here they could have a bit of trouble uh getting out of the group uh one interesting thing i find uh in in um in these tournaments is uh teams that seem to be doing well in europe uh seem to do well in the tournaments now i'm not sure how much this holds but i'm thinking of russia in 2008 and uh, you know Spain in the in the in their dynasty period, uh, their local teams were doing well in Europe here. So if that's anything to go by, uh, England having two finalists in the Champions League is a is a good sign. I gotta say though, I I kind of group. Uh, I mean, unless uh, uh, England kind of has that psychological uh, difficulty. Uh, if they're playing at uh, if they're playing at what I expect at their expectation level, I put actually Croatia in a in a race for second with uh, the Czech Republic and even Scotland. I, I think they're all uh, fairly even. Of course, you know, second place uh, in two thousand and eighteen World Cup is nothing to sniff at, but otherwise they seem. Uh, uh, at a similar level to the Czech Republic. I don't know if I'm going too far by saying that. Uh, but you have them kind of in a, in a tier above Czech Republic and Scotland? I do. I think, um, you know, Czech Republic, I think, are, are a solid middle power in, in Europe. They've proven that with their consistent qualifications, but equally so by their failure to advance deep in the tournaments. 
So I, I do consider Czech Republic in a bit of a class below Croatia, who who have who have proven they can they can win knockout games and and win the groups. And they had a very impressive start at the last World Cup. Scotland, um, I see Scotland possibly challenging Czech Republic. Um, they do have that history where they have beaten Croatia recently. And I think the, the game against England will be huge for them. I'm not sure England will have been pleased to be drawn against a Scotland team that you know is going to be extremely motivated to try and get everything they can from that game. Uh, realistically, I don't see Scotland uh, quite in the same tier with the other three. I do see them finishing last. Um, but they could have an impact. They're good enough to, to, uh, to get points potentially off anyone. And, and so they could shape the group. Uh, for sure. Yeah, I think they'll be much uh, more in the thick of it than North Macedonia. Uh, than North Macedonia. I, I, I think what you mentioned earlier, Scotland's difficulty in scoring goals will be the key issue uh, there. But I, I honestly, I find this group very, very hard to predict because I feel like any one of the teams, including Scotland, uh, uh you know, might kind of burst into the form that they have sometimes shown and uh, and uh, have a really good tournament. I think any one of them are capable of that. Certainly, and I think, um, you know, team's recent results have shown that even Czech Republic tying a Belgium team will be one of the favourites to win it. Um, I do think this is an open group, as you said. You've got four teams in here that have very inconsistent um, records. Um uh, Scotland are, are certainly capable of surprising on their day, and and England and Croatia are both capable of winning all three games, and are also capable of dropping points to any one of these teams. So I see it as a wide open group, and um, well, I do think England and Croatia will will finish top two. I wouldn't be placing a lot of money on on any of these teams because I I do think it's wide open. Yeah, I like what you said there. I mean, I, I said I, any of them could kind of come into form, but the opposite is true. All of them uh, uh, are capable, England more in the cups than in qualification, uh, but are capable of uh, kind of lapsing. But uh, give it to me straight, Connor. I want your prediction. Well, I'm going to go with a bit of an upset here and a bit of against the odds makers. I'm going to say Croatia are going to top the group ahead of England, possibly on goal difference. Um, it may not be a sign of anything. Perhaps England will heat up in the tournament. They should advance, but I'm going to give the edge and put Croatia first, then England, then Czech Republic, and then Scotland. What about you, Kev? Well, uh, it's not because I'm an English fan. I was actually born in English in uh, sorry in England, but uh, I'm I'm Irish in my heart, and and I lived in Wales. Uh, but I I still have a soft spot for England. Oh, I'm going to give it to them, uh, hoping that they can show their best form. Uh, which they honestly never really have uh, shown their best form in a tournament. Uh, Croatia, I'm lacking a bit of faith in. I don't think they're going to be nearly as good as in 2018 and perhaps uh, to the point where the uh, Czech Republic and Scotland can challenge them uh, for second place. But I find this uh, really a difficult group that could, could go any way. It'll be one of the fun ones to watch in the tournament for sure. Yeah, really competitive games. Well, I think uh, that should do it for this uh, podcast. How about you, Connor? Any closing words? No, nope, I've locked in my predictions. They're on the record, and we'll see how this one plays out. <laughs> okay, well, I will look forward to uh, meeting you soon for our discussion of Group E. Thanks very much, Kevin. Talk to you, you next time. You too, Connor. Bye.